welcome to episode 35 of the Whatnots Review Show, where each week we pick a story and we talk about it. Could be a movie, TV series, anime, manga, comic book, audio show, all kinds of entertainment. We watch it, we read it, we listen to it, we do what we need to do, and then we come back here and we talk about it. My name is Melissa Wilkinson, and I am joined, as always, by my co-captain, Kyle Springer. Howdy. Kyle, how are you this week? I'm good. I, I, I don't know if you saw me make a weird face as as you were talking there. I, I have two cups on my desk, <laughs> one on each side, and one has my Mountain Dew and one is empty. And I forgot which one was which. <laughs> so I reached for one and I picked it up and it was empty. And I was like, ugh, uh, wrong one. <laughs> this one. <laughs> so that's that's how my day is so far. <laughs> Morning struggles. <laughs> Did you do anything for the Thanksgiving holiday? Yeah. Um it was it was small. It was just me and my roommates. And then one of my roommates had a friend come over, uh, and then it was also uh, my other roommate's friend father who came we had a little small get together made a bunch of food it was fantastic we went uh non-traditional we didn't do turkey we didn't do ham um my roommate made like a apple pecan roasted pork loin and it was really good oh man it was awesome so (gasps) what did you do uh, Thanksgiving Day itself was just real quiet. I just went over to my parents' house and watched the parade. And then we have, like, a big family Thanksgiving. I mean, it's it's the smaller side of the family, so it's a total of, like, what, 10 people? Yeah. But it's, like, that's the Thanksgiving. It's at my aunt's house every year. Okay. And then after that, we went to Santa's Magical Kingdom, which is a drive through like, light show sort of thing that places will put up around Christmas okay. time. Except it's absolutely bonkers. Like, it's all the beautiful Christmas lights. And then it just gets weird. Then it just gets trippy. Yeah, I was Im- imagining something <laughs> a lot more weird and something I p- p- probably shouldn't comment on, but <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, um, it's at this place called Jellystone Park, which is just a local, like, park, forest, cabin, hiking area that has, like, the Yogi Bear license. So I was that's gonna what it's say. Called. Yeah, jelly It sounds like there'd be a lot of picnic baskets hanging around there. And so they still have all these licenses, and they still use them in the Christmas light show, but they don't know what to do with any of them. And all of them are just painted, like, plywood standees. Yeah. So there'll, there'll be, like, a penguin village, and, like, then there's Ranger Smith. And, like, it's got, like, a whole bunch of Han- Hanna-Barbera stuff, not just Yogi Bear. So, like, you know, there's Shaggy next to like a polar bear there's like a penguin village and then like there's all Shaggy, of the i don't Jetsons. think that's scooby <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's got like like sort of this christmas like sweets wonderland area but it's like a big sundae with like a face on it and a box of m&ms with legs and this year they added a whole like alien path where it's like space aliens love santa and it's all these gloopy like furry one-eyed just like weird old aliens just what? like <laughs> i'm telling you kyle it's there's no place like this that i have ever heard of anywhere else it is the weirdest holiday holiday light show you will ever drive through santa's magical fun land sounds uh santa's magical kingdom right in eureka missouri yeah <laughs> sounds like an interesting time <laughs> so that's that was my the kickoff to my holiday season was that. There you go. Good stuff then. And Good speaking stuff. of weird things. Yes. The topic for this week was the movie Little Shop of Horrors. This is a 1986 sci-fi comedy musical about a carnivorous plant from space. Directed by Frank Oz, starring Rick Moranis, Ellen Green, and Steve Martin. Yeah. I pitched you three musicals. You uh, did. I have yeah. no musical talent and or experience. <laughs> uh, actually, actually, it's kind of funny. My like 15 minutes of internet fame came because of some music that I made. 
Uh-huh. Uh, and then it left before the 15 minutes exp- expired. So it wasn't even really 15 what was this? minutes. I, I, I like making beats and stuff, like hip-hop style beats. Um, yeah. And I, I have some equipment to do it. I haven't done it in a long, long time. But um, I was making a Toonami beat tape. Uh, oh. back in the day so I, I was sampling a bunch of the cartoons and making beats and stuff like that and it was right around the time that the new incarnation of Toonami was coming back and so I was like pr- pr- I was promoting it and all that stuff and eventually when it came out uh, J- Jason DeMarco who is the creative director of Adult Swim and yeah. Toonami found it because uh, he also did a lot of the music um, or like the unofficial stuff. Um, and he was like, dude, this is awesome. This is dope. And he's, <laughs> he's, he started tweeting a bit, a bit about it and stuff. And I made a, a small amount oh. of change off of it. Um, I was just Ooh. thankful that they didn't sue me or anything for <laughs> s- sampling all of these TV shows. Um but uh, yeah, so that was that. Oh, fun story. But I I cannot read and or write me, 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 me music at all. I I'm an art major, so it's just like I can recognize patterns. Yeah. And so I would make it based off of that stuff. I was like, this all sounds good together. <laughs> <laughs> so you do not have a lot of musical experience. And this is a musical I know very well. Like, I watched it a lot as a kid. I grew up with the soundtrack. I've seen it live a couple times. So I knew what to expect. Kyle, what did you think about this thing? This was very fun. Good, I'm glad. I I wasn't expecting it to be this fun. Or at at, at least, I take that back. I wasn't expecting me to be as into it as I was. Ah, Uh, yes. Because when I think musicals it's not really me it's not my style it's not what i would prefer to watch they're definitely like they can definitely be fun Mm -hmm. but there's this like chipperness to them (laughs) that's just like it's a little off-putting to me like why is everyone Uh so happy why is what what is going on here this is so strange (laughs) um and yeah and and this i think was goofy enough Yes. Where it's like, okay, this it not a musical about kids in high school. Mm-hmm. You know, it's about a fucking alien who came down to Earth and is <laughs> eating people like that. That's like, yeah. okay, so I'm supposed to suspend my disbelief anyways. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so I, I, I think that helps get me into it. But I watched it yesterday, uh, which today is Sunday morning. Yeah. Uh, that we are recording this and it was pouring rain uh, and so it was a good like Saturday stay in bed and watch this nice. movie while it rains outside it was good it was fun good. I'm glad you enjoyed this yeah I I've, I forgot how much I like Rick Marianis uh, he's so perfect in this <laughs> he's amazing <laughs> he's a treasure <laughs> so for the audience who might not be familiar with this movie It's actually based off, like, an old, just black and white, schlocky, straight horror film. I I think maybe... I think they said it it was based off of a, like, a book or a novel that the movie was based off of. Well, I'm getting there. (laughs) I don't know. You know more than me. I think the original movie might have also been called Little Shop of Horrors. It was some old, like, if not Roger Corman, like, Mm -hmm. somebody else like Roger Corman, just, like, pulpy B-movie nonsense. Just sort of a forgettable monster movie of like the 50s. And then it was written as a Broadway musical. And like the script of a musical is called a book. Sure. So like if you see a musical, say like music and lyrics by this person, book by this person. So I don't think it's based off a book book. Like it's Uh, like a... Yeah, this was turned into like an off-Broadway stage musical. Actually, it doesn't that... make sense, but I know what you're saying. Why call it a book? That's just confusing. Books are I, books, okay? I don't, I don't, don't know. Don't I'm change not books. The Broadway captain. It's it's like The Incredibles too. Math is math. Why don't change math? <laughs> why why would they change math? Um. Okay. So, 
So yeah. it's not not like an actual like novel book, yes. but like based off of a Broadway play t- mm-hmm. type of thing. Okay. Yeah, like this weird off Broadway like musical these people made, and then that is what got turned into this movie, which is a it is a full on musical, and it's set in just this little like this area of New York City or some metropolitan place that's like it looks like this, New York. Yeah, yeah, it's they're the dumping skid- trash yeah. everywhere. <laughs> it's just a disaster. And there's this tiny struggling florist shop there and this guy named Seymour works there just struggling to get by. It's just him, his boss and like the floral arranging girl, Audrey, who he's had the biggest crush on forever. And he picks up this weird little plant. It looks like a Venus flytrap or something. It's got this like bulb head. And he's like, I think it's cool. I think it could like bring people into the store if only like it would thrive. I can't get it to thrive. And he like accidentally like pricks his thumb on like a rose thorn and it's drawing blood and the plant wants the blood. (laughs) He starts feeding the plant blood and it grows bigger and bigger until it's this huge sight and everybody comes from all around. Like the floor shop just blows up because there's so many people coming by and he becomes this like local celebrity and he starts to like win the heart of the girl in the flower shop, but she has this terrible boyfriend that he has to get out of the way first. Steve and, Martin. <laughs> yep, yep. The plant's like, and the plant can talk also. The plant yeah. can talk and sing. The plant's like, yo, feed me him. And Seymour's like, I can't feed you him. He's he's a real living person. <laughs> and the plant's like, no, he's terrible. He's a monster. He's plant food. So this is, you know, just a fun romp about, like, murder. <laughs> yeah. Murder and gardening (laughs) (laughs) murder and gardening yes those things and it's just like campy and weird but like all the performances are really good the music's really good kyle this is the same musical team that did the little mermaid howard (laughs) alan macon and howard (laughs) ashton (laughs) (laughs) that's wow yeah okay (laughs) <laughs> interesting i i i like that's a whole new world no pun intended uh <laughs> that i i i don't know about just like because i i i know there's like it, it, even within the like youtube world or like the comics industry like all of these little like creative outlets and stuff yeah. like that they're all so small and tight-knit and everyone knows each other and stuff like that because they all go to the conventions and they all mm-hmm. you know um and th- like that's yeah that's one that i don't n- know about uh and so yeah i, I mean I, I guess that would make sense too of like all of these composers <laughs> and musical people like oh you guys did the little mermaid one oh cool yeah blah 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 we did this <laughs> like oh yeah i saw that I know who you are. Yeah, um, they actually did this before they did The Little Mermaid. So I guess Disney's okay. like, yeah, we saw your work on the evil plant movie. Please come do this mermaid Now we have an evil underwater mermaid movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it was a lot of fun. I'm... Well, like I said, usually not one for mm-hmm. musicals and stuff like that. But this is uh, this is good. Yeah, I'm glad. And did this remind you of anything? Like, yes. If, you, if somebody liked this, what else would they like, Kyle? Oh, um, you, or like, I, it, or I was like... thinking something else, which I will get into in spoilers of just oh, like okay. this reminded me of something in particular, and I think it's why okay. I liked it so much. Uh, uh-huh. But it's not like it's not a book or anything, not really. Um, I would say if if you liked this, what would this remind you of? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I've I, got some. I I was even gonna just say if you want more Rick Moranis, go watch like Spaceballs or something. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, not it, it's not a musical, though they 
do make a joke about Spaceballs the musical in uh, <laughs> in there. I I think, um, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, Rick Moranis is good, and I, I I don't. I mean, he hasn't been in anything since I I, I forget ex- ex- exactly why he like stopped. I, um, I think he just like I think maybe his wife died or something, and he was, just like he yeah, just went off to something... be like a dad for a while. Yeah. Um, but he's so good, and I, I yes. forgot how good he is and stuff. Yes. So go watch more Rick Moranis stuff. <laughs> go watch Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. <laughs> I came up with some other musicals, like stage musicals. Okay. Somebody could go see if they liked this, because like seeing live theater is amazing. It's one of my favorite things to do. Like Whenever I get the opportunity, oh. I go do it. Oh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Okay. Because yeah. the plant, um, I I, f- I forget the guy who vo- voiced him has the same type of voice. If it's not the same person, because it, it, they sound super similar. Okay. So the voice of the plant in this movie is like an old musician named Levi Stubbs, which is like the best name. I I think I heard of the band he was from, but I don't remember it off the I top of my head. I think it's the head. Four Tops. Yeah, 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 yeah. Them. I've heard of them. I don't. I don't yeah. know any other stuff. But dad music. The Oogie Boogie Man in in A Nightmare Before Christmas is an actor named Ken Page, who is actually a local St. Louis actor. Oh, who does cool. a lot of local St. Louis theater. So he, and he okay. Yeah, he I was the voice going of with this. Audrey too. The last time, like the local theater did Little Shop of Horrors. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's the <laughs> same. It's the same type of music when each of them like do their songs. When Audrey yeah. two and Oogie B- B- Buggy do their stuff, it's that same mm-hmm. type of like Louisiana blues rock yeah. type of thing. Um, so that that's neat. Go go watch that too. But you you were mentioning some more musicals. Yeah, these are some musicals I've seen on stage, and I don't think there's any filmed adaptations of them out there for you to watch, like there is with this. But there might be something you on find... YouTube, like a yeah, local yeah. performance you know, somewhere. Find them in your local theaters. You know, theaters great. Collect all seven. If you, if you like, kind of this like 1950s like aesthetic and era of music Mm -hmm. there is an elvis jukebox musical called all shook up where just all of the songs are elvis songs yes and i saw this last summer and i had no idea what to think about it because frankly like it doesn't have to be good to be popular because people love elvis so much but the show was actually so much fun and it's just got, it's loosely framed around the Shakespearean story of Twelfth Night, which is a story of like, you know, a girl goes undercover as a boy and then like somebody falls for her as the boy, but then there's a boy she has a crush on and it's just crazy, like, like a weird messed up love triangle where like everybody's in love with everybody else and like somebody writes a love letter and it goes to the wrong person and it gets misinterpreted and it's just like the united states postal service (laughs) it's just this big like romantic comedy like mishap Uh so this is like a 1950s elvis like big a-line skirts and like grease up pompadours it's that and it's actually super fun like yeah you know, even if you're not an Elvis fan, like the story of this musical is just like a really sweet, good time. And if sense. you want something weird, Kyle, are you familiar with Bat Boy? I, yes, maybe. <laughs> you know, from the weekly world news that like, out, like completely fake tabloid magazine. I'm familiar You've with that man. It's like. <laughs> Have you ever seen the picture that's like Bat Boy found in cave and it's this Photoshop like baby Mole with man, mouth real. stretched out? <laughs> <laughs> it's this Photoshop baby with like big eyes and like bat ears and their mouth stretched out, like Yeah. Bat Boy. Didn't they make so, a play based off of that too? Yes, yes. There is another off Broadway production called Bat Boy, the musical okay. <laughs> that I have seen and is also like really well done like beyond just being this gimmick it's just weird and dark and the music's good and oh it's a little goofy but not like a total comedy oh it's another 
it's, it's a more tabloid horror. musical. <laughs> yes, yes. It's like more horror based than like Little Shop would be. But okay. yeah, if you can find a local theater around you that is doing Bat Boy the musical, check it Sweet. out. Sweet. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, housekeeping before we get into spoiler stuff. Yes. Um, it right now is just the usual shenanigans. Go like, share, subscribe on all the social medias, sell your soul, do whatever you have to do. Uh, <laughs> we could absolutely use your help to get the word out there. Uh, I think on Twitch, we're sitting at like 25 followers right now, which is very small. Um, and we're hoping to get to 50. Uh, same thing for our YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're heading at like 30 or 31, somewhere around there, hoping to get to 50. Um, so twitch.tv slash the whatnots or the whatnots.com slash live streams is where you can find our Twitch. And yeah. if you just search the whatnots podcast, um, excuse me, on YouTube, uh, you will find us on there. So go ahead, go go help us out because that would be fantastic. Um, yeah. There was no episode of the Captain's Log from this past week, but if you still haven't gone and checked out our mm-hmm. previous episode of that, go go check out the Captain's Log as well. That was a lot of fun, Melissa. You were on that episode yeah, as well. They're talking about more St. Louis stuff, which is mostly what I like to do. Yes. <laughs> um, we we named that that one Murder Cycle. <laughs> so go go check it out if you want to find out what the Murder Cycle is. <laughs> um but yeah, that is all the housekeeping I have. So spoiler warning in full effect. We're about mm-hmm. to dive into this and rip it to shreds. Uh, and oh, no, <laughs> she's like, "Oh God, you hated it. You really hated it." <laughs> no, um, it, it no. Uh, we're we're just a, a, about to potentially spoiler spoil yeah. things uh, mm-hmm. if you have not seen this yet. So go watch Little Shop of Horrors uh, with Rick Moranis and everyone else. <laughs> Ellen, whatever her name was. I don't Ellen know Green. Uh, what, she is. I was going to ask what else is she in because I don't know her. She was one of the ants in Pushing Daisies, which I know you haven't seen, but that's also like kind of a sci fi dark comedy, slightly musical murder based show. So it makes sense that she, she would was be in there. there. Does she have the same accent? Does uh, that same like hype? I think York she's also got kind of like accent. a high breathy voice, but it's not like the same like New York accent that Audrey that, has. That was like the one thing I hated about this <laughs> movie. I was like, I hate her voice. Oh my god, I can't stand it. It's so high pitched and it's so squealy, and she's so just like, it, like I mean, it's it's a musical, so I can see that they're all like overacting and stuff yeah. like that, you know. So it's like I I I understand that part but she's overacting this accent and this like <laughs> high pitched like hyper feminine just character and I'm just like Ooh, this, this is <laughs> not for me yeah I can see how that might be like it's a great performance but it, it, it yeah. would be a lot for your ears after a while yeah she I mean she <laughs> does a good job and I, I think hers was the most noticeable when the whoever did her like songs I think it's still her. Like, I think really? everybody did their own singing. It might be, like, pre-recorded well, and they're, like, lip-syncing to it. I don't know that part. But, yeah, they're all singing. It might be that. Um, it, it's, it, it was one of those things where the accent changed. Yeah. And it was like, okay, now you're in a completely different octave that I don't <laughs> think that that character would have been able to get just speaking normally, you yeah. know. Um so yeah, that 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 was a the, the, she, she she was the one that whatever they did there to get the music in, it was the one that was most noticeable. Yeah, um, I mean, but yeah. So I I I was about to say something of mm. like what this kind of reminded me of, and yeah. what, and I'm I'm just gonna jump right to that. Yes. Um. So I, I think one of the reasons why I ended up liking this so much uh, 
was because I I now really just want a version of Little Shop of Horrors set in Gotham City with Harley oh. Quinn, the Joker, and Poison Ivy. <laughs> And it's perfect. That's why you like this. <laughs> it's it was it was perfect. I was like, that's like Steve Martin's character is the Joker. <laughs> Ellen Green's character is Harley. She has that like New York accent, like oh pudding. Um, and <laughs> and then there's po- Poison Ivy, who like Rick Mur- like if if. <laughs> Poison Ivy was this small, unassuming, like, lesbian woman that looked like Rick Moranis, (laughs) which which would be amazing. (laughs) Then, wouldn't it be great? (laughs) Then, like, like, I want that as a graphic novel or, like, an animated movie. Just, like, Little Shop of Horrors in Gotham. It would be amazing. It would fit perfectly. So yeah, I was like, I right. I can't unsee this. Like I, <laughs> I never even thought about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it 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 was. I I I just. I mean, it, like, it's one of those things. At first, I was like, I miss Rick Moranis. Man. <laughs> like he was so good and all of this stuff. He looks like he's so cool. He like he's a complete dork, but he's like it's just. I I I want to be Rick Moranis, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He's something good to aspire to. I think you can yeah. always count on Rick yeah. Moranis. Yeah, and it 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 was it was it wasn't until I saw Steve Martin's character where he's this like biker greaser type of character who's the, who then turns out to be a dentist. Yes, but he's like he's basically elvis like his character is elvis but then when he gets into his like sadistic dentist role he like he takes the laughing gas for himself and so he's Mm -hmm. just like maniacally laughing as he's like hurting people and stuff and he has this like odd smile and his hair is all disheveled i'm like that's that's the joker like, now I, I really want to see Steve Martin play the Joker. I yeah, I mean this was made in '86, right? The mm-hmm. Batman the animated series didn't really come out until like '91, something like that. Though I know, um, though I know the Joker character was more based off of the tr- the trickster that Mark mm. Hamill did in the live action Flash show in 1990. Um, but yeah, it was one of those things like, huh, that's could have been inspiration for some of the animated features interesting who knows if that is true or not but it is head canon now (laughs) were you surprised when he turned out to be a dentist because like i said i saw this movie for the first time when i was like eight and so all of this is just i'm used to it and i'm like oh that's probably a weird turn for somebody who has never seen this movie before yeah, so he he does the thing where he's going t- to work and mm-hmm. he like rips off his biker j- jacket and it's this song about his mom like wanted him to be a d- dentist and stuff like that. And I think I think I know someone who had re- referenced or I, I had heard some kind of reference yeah. to this song before um, mm-hmm. or something similar. Uh, and I I I guess I just I I missed the first couple lines or I was like thinking in my own head of like oh I I remember this one thing from you know something 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 that I missed the first couple of lines and I thought he was talking about like how his mom wanted him to be a dentist but he's not oh and then I'm like <laughs> oh there he he's that that man is a dentist Yes. And then it, the the line from to- Toy Story comes up. It's like I don't think he's been to medical school. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I, I I don't think that man is actually a doctor. <laughs> what a cool <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he is the sin of this movie. He truly. is, but uh, yes, I mean, so it, like it was one of those like they're actually he actually is a dentist. Okay, okay, that's like. I, <laughs> 
I'm here for it. Let's let's go. <laughs> but so yeah. so so you you I, I guess since you've seen it so many times, it's kind of lost the surprise for you uh, some. Well, I watched the movie like when I was a kid, but mostly like we had the soundtrack. And so I listened to the soundtrack a lot because like, we went on a lot of road trips when I was a kid. And like we're so little, like we have no sense of like our own music taste, but we want something to listen to. Sure. So dad gave us just a bunch of soundtracks for movies we had seen. So I've listened to this so much that I know the musical parts really well, but the stuff outside of that, I always forget about. Like, I'm always like, oh yeah, John Candy is in this movie and he's playing a character named Wink Wilkinson. And you would think somebody with my own name would stick out to me, but no, I'm like, oh yeah, John Candy's in this, Bill Murray's in this, Jim Belushi, I forget about completely every time. Like I remember that I don't remember John Candy and Bill Murray, but I'm always shocked. Like Jim Belushi walking in at the end. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was his character's name? Who? Jim Belushi. Oh, uh, I it, don't know. It was so when they said his name, because I mean, you know, he's at the d- d- dentist and he, he just looks g- g- giddy. Oh, no. to... oh. Uh, Bill Murray was the guy at the dentist. His name oh. was Arthur Denton. Yeah. So Arthur. So th- this whole like g- Gotham thing when <laughs> they said denton i was like wait did they say dent <laughs> it, it, is he is he fucking two-face like <laughs> the, the, oh, just, man, but it, bill murray is two-face movie yeah like th- this th- it's perfect oh. for this thing um <laughs> and but yeah so i i had to l- 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 look it up and it was it was it was just like oh, okay they said dent dentin it's not dent it's not harvey dent it's arthur denton but yeah it was just it was one of those things i had to like pause it and go back what did they say like (laughs) they're like this is such a strong musical like i said it's got like such a well-respected musical team behind it Mm -hmm. but i it was nice to sit down and watch the actual movie instead of just listening to the soundtrack again because all the little bits in between are also really good like when that first customer comes into the flower shop after they put like little Audrey two in the window and he's like, hello, I came in to see your strange and interesting plant. <laughs> yeah. And that guy is Christopher Guest, who's become like one of my favorite directors. He did like Waiting for Guffman and Best in Show and all these movies I love that you might not know, but you might know him from, uh, he's in Spinal Tap. I he's one of the guys in Spinal Tap. He's one of the guys in Spinal Tap, and he's the six-fingered man in uh, The Princess Bride. Okay, that I've seen. So that's that guy, and he's so funny. And, like, I had no idea, like, this was my first ever exposure to him as a kid. Because it's just, like, it's so entertaining while you're watching it, but there's just so much other stuff going on in the movie that you forget it's there until you're watching it again. And you're like, oh, yeah, that guy, this weird, like consumerist man droid that's like i will take fifty dollars worth of roses while i am here you can't you bring cha- a 50 yeah you have chains for a hundred it's 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 that like 50s advertising aesthetic mixed with like the like leave it to beaver style yes. family like everything is just too perfect for yes. some of these characters you know um i i think the 50s like is a really good time to have this set because the 50s was this era of legitimate prosperity and also like the illusion of prosperity. So you've got, it is such an advertising filled era. And I like that Audrey's character during the whole Somewhere That's Green song, Mm -hmm. like she's naming so many specific things. Like, I'm going to cook like Betty Crocker. We're going to have our TV dinners, you know, in front of our television. Like, it's all so, like, materialistic and specific. But she's saying it so genuinely. Like, she can't wait to have, like, you know, uh, this brand of dishwasher. can't wait to be housewife. (laughs) <laughs> yes yes and to the tune of the lion king just can't wait to be king <laughs> now just can't wait to be a housewife <laughs> and the 
song, I feel like, and a lot of the tone of this movie is kind of a commentary on the era of the 50s and that, yeah. like, super glossy, like, advertising and, you know, just capitalism and just, like, prosperity and get a better car than your neighbors have. But yeah. it's sort of making fun of that time period without really making fun of the people who lived there, except for Christopher Guest, like, well, if you can't break a hundred, I'll just buy a hundred dollars worth of roses. Like, the movie looks at Audrey's adoration of, like, these specific branded things with this sort of affection. Like, though it's not her fault that she's so kind of vapid about this. That's just when she lived. Isn't it sweet that she wants this life with this man she likes? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a very sweet song and it is something like I think about more as I get older like you know what you're right I don't want to go to bed at 9 15 but otherwise that sounds good <laughs> and like in my dreamy, maybe 9 30 yeah yeah <laughs> in my, my dreamiest times where like some handsome man walks past me and smiles like deep within my soul I just hear Ellen Green singing a fence of real chain link like that is the sound of my like longing for a domestic life <laughs> it's amazing. real like it's so goofy but it does hit this like real emotion within you like yeah i don't just want this it's not a big grandiose form of love it's no i'll cook dinner for him and he'll mow the lawn and we'll take care of the kids like it's so beautifully simple like i love that number and i love it more as i get older that's funny well, well why did you think of them having the two separate b b b beds <laughs> when, <laughs> once they finally show their room <laughs> I love it. I love two separate beds it's amazing on, like 1950s like they've got everything there it's so funny. That was one of the moments that I laughed out loud. I was like, ah, there's two beds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I... Like, this is a fairly, like, chaste movie in terms of their relationship, and I liked that. Like, he thinks, oh, gosh, Audrey's pretty, but, like, the fact that she wears all these skimpy outfits doesn't play into it. He's not like... Oh boy, she leaned too close to me, and her shirt was real low cut. Like it's nothing there, like that. There's when when we watched Young Frankenstein, right? That's yes, like yes. that's that almost the exact opposite head of that, where where they like lift her out of the thing, and their her boobs are like right <laughs> right there. They're just like, oh hey. <laughs> <laughs> I I did love all of Audrey's outfits in this movie because they are like real just over the not super skimpy but just like really low cut and like really close fitting and like her boobs are pushed all the way up yeah and it's not like her d evil boyfriend the dentist is like making her wear this stuff like you don't get the impression oh she's wearing it for him or she's wearing it because oh well this will help me catch a husband and if I catch a husband then I can get out of skid row like it really seems like she's wearing them for herself like that's what she, she wants likes to, yeah yeah and i like again this is more stuff like i think about as i get older like you go audrey if you want to wear a super low cut skin tight yeah. cheetah print dress and dream of this pastel housewife home do it live both yeah well because once once you, uh she kind of finds out that uh what's his name is dead steve martin's character <laughs> Um, His name's Orphan Scrivello, I think. Orphan Scrivello. We can just call him the dentist. Everyone does. The dentist. Um, <laughs> Crentis the dentist. Little office reference. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, when she when she finds out and like she has that crying fit of like, oh no, what does my life become and stuff like that. Uh, you do find out a little bit more about her backstory, yeah. story, and it does seem like she like used to be a stripper or did something along those lines, but now she's not, and she and she she has that line of like, I didn't even used to wear outfits like this, but now she's I like, do hey. to like hope yeah, to like says, better like, myself. Like it's it's not it's not yeah like like you said it's not it's not to like get men to hit on her or, or something it's because yeah. she wants to because she wants to feel 
better about herself. Yeah. She used to work. At, she used to be like a cocktail waitress at the sleazy bar, and she says they used to make me wear cheap outfits, not nice ones like these. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like I feel that yes. They, for as as the unsexualized as the like that that like their mm. relationship is. Yeah. One of the first jokes in the movie is kind of the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. When when we first learn that the plant wants blood, yeah. and the the woman walks in at the radio station yeah. and is like bending over just a little bit and that's when the plant perks up just like it's a period joke it's a oh. period joke this is terrible <laughs> <laughs> why why would you do this like <laughs> yeah i was really struck by on this viewing like even the dentist like isn't that like his relationship with Audrey isn't that sexual like it is, but it's less than you would think. And the horniest character in the movie is the space plant. Like the space plant has these tendrils just wrapping all over oh, everybody. Yeah. Like Audrey and Seymour, the both the, of them. The like this space <laughs> plant was definitely a power bottom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the space plant's like so predatory. Yeah. It, and then, like it's making you do the actual like food gathering predatory stuff for it, but like in terms of the other use of that word, oh boy, that plant so so skeevy. Feed me. <laughs> but I also like that they're like so innocent, like Seymour and Audrey, that they're just like, whoa, whoa what are you doing? When the like vine like wraps around their waist or something, like they're not reading it like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yes, I went there. The ch- ch- chat is freaking out. I went there. The plant is a power bottom. <laughs> 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 but um, yeah. So, what w- what was something else that 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 you that you wrote in your notes? Yes, it's just you, Sam. I, Hi, Sam. I see you in there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take notes for this one because I'm like, well, I know this so well. But I kept a log of mental notes. Like, Just another thing I it. wanted to say, this is something, like, I noticed about the movie the first time I watched it when I was, like, eight years old. Because I feel like it was a big joke in things in the 90s that there would be, like, a tough guy. And then you would find out they've got, like, a really feminine name. Like, don't call me Leslie. My name is Slick. Like, do you remember that kind of joke that was around a lot in the 90s? Yep. And I always admired that you've got this, like, masculine plant that has a feminine name and, like, there's no joke about that. Like, nobody mentions it. The plant doesn't seem to care that it's been saddled with a feminine name. I don't know. I always thought that was, like, weirdly progressive. <laughs> I don't know. I liked it. Yeah. I, I mean, it's an alien. Yeah. I don't know how is. alien g- g- genders work. I barely know how human <laughs> g- gender works. So. Yeah. <laughs> I like just how, yeah, I like that about the plant that it's like, but I don't care. You know, <laughs> call me whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. So I here's with the whole like gotham thing that (laughs) yes that aside how do you feel like this would play out as a more like serious story because that's that's something i thought about too like if if you took the music or like the musical out of this um like do do you think it it would still fit it would still work well or is it just like well what's the point now because there's no (laughs) There's no happy, fun song, dance t- t- time thing. I think the music really puts the weird horror stuff, like, in a good contrast. Like, I've heard the original just, like, black and white mm-hmm. B horror movie this was originally based off of, like, isn't that entertaining or anything that like good. that. Like, it's kind of dull. So that's why people, like, just took the concept of it and then dressed it up a whole bunch and made it this fun stage show. Okay. Oh, there's an alternate ending to this movie. Did you know that? No. Like, Frank Oz originally wanted, like, and I think this is how the stage show ends. Like, uh, 
Jim Belushi comes in at the end and he's like the salesman and he wants to take like little clippings of the plant and make other little plants and just send them like that's like the new toy this year like you, your old little Audrey too for you to grow and he's like this could be in thousands of households across the US and they're like thousands of households all across the country we have to stop that in like the original cut of the movie that happens and like Audrey too like grows huge into this kaiju almost. Yes, and like so th- that's that that's the one that I saw. That that's the original one, right? That's the director's cut of it, and like okay. I and that's what I must the, have watched. Yeah, I'm which used was to it the was character. a lot of fun. I was like, I like this. This is yeah, fant- <laughs> fantastic. It's wild. Yeah, I like the theatrical cut. Like that's the one I grew up watching, and the de- like I own like a really nice Blu-ray set of this movie because I like it so much, and it's got both cuts of it in there. And I've watched the director's cut before, mm-hmm. but I like the theatrical cut better, where like so, they do destroy Audrey too at the end, and they do go have that picket fence life. Which do you think you would like better? So well, I, mean, uh, see, I just described it to you, but. So Audrey won. That's weird <laughs> to call her that. Yeah. Uh, she survives then in the theatrical yeah. release? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. Because I, I really like what they did with the director's cut ending then, the one that I saw. It, I it r- reminded me. Yeah, it reminded me of uh, w- what we just watched, uh, American Werewolf in London, where at the end, yeah. it, it just, it goes yeah. to shit, and everything is <laughs> going crazy, and there's car accidents, and bodies flying out the window, and stuff, and this is just like, yeah, like, what if it's, what if it ends like a Godzilla movie, but there's yes. like five Godzillas, and everyone's running and dying, and there's like screaming and fire and explosions, and the end in bright, funky colors. <laughs> it's like I kind of like that. It just yeah. you know, but I, yeah, for... I, I, I guess the whole kaiju aspect isn't really what I necessarily liked the most. I liked yeah. the tr- the tragedy of of the like, hey, we can finally be together and escape and do all of this. And then it doesn't happen at the end. Mm-hmm. Like that that felt more right. It felt more theatric, more Shakespearean, more, <laughs> I don't know, Greek so, tr- tragedy <laughs> kind so of thing. You watched the more serious version of the movie and asked me if I would like it to be even more serious than that. And I'm like, no, Kyle, I watched the shiny, happy version, and that's the one I like. I didn't because... know. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's funny and like I forgot to check with you like which version you were watching because I didn't know like which one would be more widely available the theatrical cut or the director's cut but I knew them both so I figured I can talk about either there you go like the director's cut like it's entertaining it looks very good like the effects are fantastic like I definitely recommend like you find that footage somewhere and you watch it but like it's better don't listen to her (laughs) I prefer the (laughs) theatrical happy ending I think because these are characters we have seen struggle so much and like they don't Seymour does not have enough faults to deserve an ending that bad. Like he really fights against like, no, I can't kill the dentist. A couple people. He's fine. Yeah. Like he really does not want to. And it's like, he only kills the dentist and he doesn't even kill the dentist. Like he goes to the dentist and the dentist kills himself with the laughing gas on accident. Mm-hmm. And then Seymour's just like, well, I've got this dead body now. I might as well feed it to the plant. Like he fights so much. He struggles so much. And he just wants like, like he doesn't want fame and fortune. Like he gets right. it and he never likes it. He turns it all away. He's like, I just want, they both want the same thing, which it I, makes I a really better like. Villain. No, it no, makes I, a better villain. If he was greedy, if he did take that turn, like, why, yes, I will take the room at the Ritz wrapped in velvet, covered in glitz. Maybe then it would feel like narratively, okay, you've earned the disaster ending. But, like, him and Audrey are too pure. Like, it felt too dark for me. Like, I get it. It's entertaining. It's, like, shocking. But I don't, like, it's, like, the theatrical ending sits better with me. And I also love the idea of they escape out to this world and, like, 
to have this idyllic 1950s like you know neatly mown lawn and white picket fence and like big pastel dress with an apron and like seaman's got a seymour's got like a beer gut and he's just like mowing the lawn and you know fixing the car and just living this normal life but oh yeah we did escape this like evil carnivorous space plant once like i love that idea i like the way that idea fits with like the rest of the movie that this would go on to just be like a blip in their otherwise normal 1950s lives. So earlier on, you mentioned you thought this was also kind of kind of a comment on the whole like 1950s advertisement, yeah. capitalism era, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. That's that's also kind of why I think the director's cut ending is better because it is yet like even more of a comment Mm -hmm. on on that rather than just like let's just escape it all and you know live a happily ever after (laughs) it is this thing of like hey like we've created this monster now everyone wants it they're buying it up and here's it's still destroying us right Mm -hmm. um so so i i to me that that just speaks out a little more than like leave it to beaver I, I like that Seymour and Audrey, like, escape that. Like, they don't fall into that, you know, capitalistic trap or anything like that. And they go off to this world. And, like, I love somewhere that's green because it's all the best parts of that, like, hyper branding. Yeah. Like, she doesn't want Betty Crocker because it's like, well, it's been tested to be the best cake on the market. And it's so much better than Duncan Hines. And you want to make a better cake than Shirley at the book club, don't you? It's like... <laughs> oh, it's like a a nice thing I can make for my family. Like it's, she believes in the best of just products and goods for people. And I like that that, oh, like you can get out of it. Like you can't escape from the skid row of of materialism and just live in a better version of that. You can utilize it better. I don't know. Wouldn't that still be materialism though? That she's wanting these bad, I mean, it's still like, yeah, I, I think down in her heart, she just she wants the best for other people as as mm-hmm. well. Like I like she, I think she wants to to live the type of life where she can help people and she can mm-hmm. make them happy. Um, but in in I, I guess maybe a more subconscious kind of way, she is being like, well, to do that, I need more things. I need the main <laughs> brand things. I need the better home and garden white picket fence and mm-hmm. the easy bake uh, oven and, you know, all the workout I... machines to to <laughs> make my butt bigger and all but that, she, you know. She also grew up with nothing. So, like, it's completely understandable, like, that she wants, like, oh, I could have a name brand something. And it's like, yeah, yeah, you should have a name brand something. You've earned a name brand something. And I like the theatrical version because it seems more like the world is bad, but you can still be good if you think about everything in this like very domestic, sweet state of mind. If you try and do the best for people, if you like really strive to get out without like throwing that many people under the bus beneath you like it's possible to be good in a bad world like i like i don't know if it's better but i like the optimistic theatrical ending of this like theatrical release of the movie ending better because like i said the actual stage play that version of theatrical the stage play ends with the more director's cut version i think well i guess because the play came first. The director's cut follows the original stage play. <laughs> and I did want to talk a little bit about how stage adaptations of this work. Okay. Or, well, I guess this is an adaptation of the stage version. But I always think about it the other way. Because, like, I knew the movie before sure. I'd ever gotten to see it in the theater. And another reason I love this movie so much is that I think it is the best version of this story because this isn't except for the plant this isn't a show with a lot of spectacle to it yeah, like it doesn't have amazing. like amazing yeah the plant creature is like all of those like practical special effects all that puppetry is fantastic and it's always really impressive whenever i've seen it in a live stage show too it's always like oh i'm so excited to see this big puppet 
I wonder if the like schematics are online. Like, here's how to make your own Audrey too. <laughs> yeah, there's actually um, there's a local university whose theater department like built a really high quality Audrey two and a that's amazing. A, a dentist chair because that's not something everybody can come up with. And they rent those out to like high school productions that do not have the budget or know how to do it. So like, if you see local high school productions of Little Shop of Horrors, like you're just seeing the same puppet in the same dentist chair over and over again, because yeah. like one college is like, okay, we did all the work for you. <laughs> but this, I think is, this story I think is very well suited to be a movie because the times I've seen it on a stage, even like a slightly smaller, like high school auditorium stage instead of like a big professional theater, there's never enough of it to like, fill the stage because except for the big plant and like you know there's a the skid, sets are small yeah like skid row is a fairly big number you can have a big crowd of people around seymour Which, and the meek shall inherit number but side note on this the that first like skid yeah. row number the way the song ends is really creepy because <gasps> they're all they're like out on the street looking up at the camera but they're mm -hmm. not actually looking up they're like looking below it and then they're eyes are looking up so they have yeah. this like oh, yes. i'm gonna murder you like you know <laughs> like <laughs> just this weird like cover. what like that's creepy like i don't i don't know but yeah, oh, I, carry I on a, oh that's a really good opening number and i can talk more about like the musical numbers later but the there's not a lot of big spectacle in the show except for the puppet and the puppet itself is like tall but you know, it's not that wide it's just like every time i've seen it live even in like the highest quality professional production it's like this feels like there's not enough of this to fill the stage like this feels small it feels off they try and, and like this isn't a show meant for like big choreography or anything like that so like it never quite feels right in a stage interesting even if everybody's doing a fantastic job like it just doesn't seem like that's where it fits so i thought i think the movie's like such a good version of it and like of course i'll go see this play like anytime i can see it live just because i love it so much but the movie i think will always be my favorite and perhaps the best adaptation of the story in any form okay interesting i i I feel like it would work just fine. I haven't seen it, obviously. Maybe I just need to see it in like a black box or something. And like, the, it sounds like a small thing that I keep talking about the scale of it. But like, having seen so many big stage musicals, like to see one that's like very small like that and doesn't have like real impressive choreography, like they're just not because well, we utilizing the stage very much just by the nature of the show and how it works i so i i feel like it's more of like a story based yes. one than like yeah. hey let's do all these theatrical stuff to like entertain yes. people and make a big spectacle you know um but i like i i i feel like it would work really well on a smaller stage um yeah. i i don't know much about theater or anything like that but even the the three singers in the movie yes. that are like the k kind of narrators yes um are is kind of like the chorus or the fates in like yes. greek plays where that you know they are the ones narrating what's happening on on this stuff and so like in in my mind it it just it kind of fits that mold like i imagine it being mm -hmm. on in like in this little small amphitheater yeah and and things just working there you did you kind of just have to use your imagination to mm -hmm. expand these sets and you know and do stuff like that but yeah it, it, it is as the name implies, a little shop of yeah. horrors, you know? I'd, I'd really like to see this in a black box theater sometime. Which what does I don't that know mean? You... A black box theater is a small, it's like a small enclosed theater that usually doesn't seat that many people. And it's not that big. And sometimes it might be like in the round where you're all around the stage or like you surround the stage on like three sides of it. Uh -huh. And it's smaller and it's more intimate and usually okay. the rooms are painted like entirely black or something like that like in most 
like schools have a black box theater. Like where I went to school, they had like the big theater where mm-hmm. they could do like the Broadway level stuff. And then like the black box was where I saw Bat Boy the musical. And I think this is a show like meant for black boxes and I have not seen it there yet. So seeing it on a big stage, just like, oh, there's not enough of you to fill this. Like, oh, like it just makes it feel weird that it's almost like drowning in the scale of the place it has been put when I'm used to it completely filling up my TV screen at home. Maybe the problem is the stages you've seen it at, like the stages themselves are Mm -hmm. bigger than what's required. And if you saw it on a, like at a, at an actual smaller stage, that I think that help. I, I think it would, but also I think just, the movie's got this liveliness to it that I've never quite seen translate to the stage. And it might be like Frank Oz's direction and all the performers he has and just like all the extra stuff that he throws in there. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I just really love this movie and I'll always go see the stage play, but I've yet to be impressed quite with a stage adaptation like nothing comes close to standing up to the movie for me. And I don't know if it's nostalgia or if it is like there's some practical limitation that is like keeping okay. the stage play from reaching what the movie can do. I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. Musical numbers. What was your favorite? Oh, I, don't, I really like them all. I, I don't know how much you know like musical theory but they're like musical musical theater theater theory there's like a there's something called the i want song the the i won or i want the i want song this is the song that usually comes at the beginning like using a little the little mermaid as an example that's her part of your world song like earth's what she wants to have happen yes yes and so this movie does that a lot like most songs are wanting songs like skid row is the song for seymour and audrey and for like their entire setting around them and then she's got somewhere that's green that's Mm -hmm. her like own personal dreams right and then there instead of an i want song like the plant gives seymour like the you want sort of song like this tempting song oh like it's a musical with a lot of numbers about like desire like you get songs about wanting things songs about being offered things Why the dentist fucking song- power bottom he's not saying what he wants <laughs> he's trying to incept the idea into you want to do this to me <laughs> like the dentist song is like a song from somebody who has like already gotten what they want yeah like he's on top of the world he doesn't want anything else he's like i I like my life. I'm good at it. End of the thing. And like, I like the way this musical uses that classic template and just sort of duplicates it and like folds it back on itself. That's cool. I I think for me, I liked Suddenly Seymour. Yes. That's a really good song. Beautiful Um, song. Especially because they have... Not because they they're not necessarily singing over each other. They're not yeah. like singing different yeah. things at the same t- duet. Yeah, time. but it is yeah, it is more of a duet. You you do get multiple perspectives in that song, mm-hmm. um, and then at the end they you, you know they match up. Um, yeah, and I I I thought that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I like that song a lot, especially because. Like, this isn't a story of a nerd wins over a pretty girl. She already likes him, and that song happens after he He just thinks, like, she doesn't deserve someone like him. Yeah, and, like, this just happens after, like, actions have been taken. And, like, the dentist kills himself, and Seymour, like, really does away with him. And ultimately, Audrey makes the choice to say, you know what? No, I'm not that sad about it. Like, he, I'm glad he's gone. Like, it feels earned. Yeah. Like, it's not like he came in there and swooped in and took care of her problems for her. And it's like, look, I did a nice thing. And now you like me. Like, <laughs> they always liked each other. He was always nice. And, like, he just kind of laid some things into action that, like, 
Like she could have done it at any time. Like, yeah. you know what? I'm done with this guy, but it happens after he dies and he dies kind of associated with Seymour. Like he probably could have overdosed on his laughing gas at any point, but he does it like when Seymour comes into his office. And I don't know, like, I feel like I like, I, I just like that song. I like that it is earned and it doesn't fit into some obnoxious cliche, like nerd wins over pretty girl. Yeah. And it's it, the, the name of the song is also kind of a double entendre, too, right? Because <laughs> like her eyes are being opened, and suddenly she can see more, yeah. right? Yeah. And just like, <laughs> uh, hey, there's there's more to this life than just like sitting here. Like I actually do deserve this nice thing, you know? Yeah. Like I that makes sense for her character but then his name is also Seymour and so it's like suddenly you're you're noticing him you you got you got the hots for Seymour (laughs) which she always had and this is like the moment where she's like let's put this into action like that's the action song for both of them that both of them are like I'm not letting the status quo stand anymore like I'm going to do something to change it. I'm going to do something to express myself, to start to pave my way forward. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That makes sense. Let's see. Was there any other songs that I wanted to talk about? I I, I don't think so. Um, Again, I I liked the the tragedy of the director's mm-hmm. cut and seeing uh, her da da die and then things go yeah. to shit because it also gives them an opportunity to like I mean I, I I don't know what happened in the theatrical v- v- version since that's the one you watched mm-hmm. but they do kind of a reprise of the like something g- g- or somewhere right. g- yeah. g- 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 green song and that that kind of wraps it up really nicely yeah of of like hey she she finally got what she wanted in a way right where she's she's finally with seymour and she's happy Mm -hmm. and she's getting to die happy right yeah so and the the director cut has the numbers um don't feed the plants is it in there i don't know Okay, that might be in the stage version because the stage version has like a final number where like everybody comes out after the big tragedy and it's like whatever they offer you, don't feed the plants. It, that that must not have been in the one that I watched because they all went batshit to okay. buy it's, them up. It, yeah, Let's it's buy the, all the plants. Let's feed the plants. <laughs> it's in the stage version and like a recording of that was included on like the soundtrack CD for the movie I had when I was a kid. And it's like bonus track from the stage play. So M- Melissa, I, I know you're also not much of a video game player. No. Nah. Um, but the new Super Smash Bros. game should be coming out shortly after this yeah. episode goes live and one of the new smash characters is uh the piranha plant oh Uh, and and so i i just imagine that everything (laughs) that happened in this movie is what happened at nintendo and why the piranha (laughs) plant is finally in smash like he just took over like demanded blood and was like i need to be in smash Mm mm-hmm and then they were just like, fine, well, don't, don't eat us, you know, just let's keep it civil. <laughs> That's fun. Good. <laughs> You're like, I don't understand a word of that, but okay. Uh, uh, I, I like that idea. It's a weird modern retelling of, oh, I just want to be in a video game. Like, I, I want blood and also please put me in, uh, in Smash, Smash where I can fight, you know, Captain Falcon. <laughs> Hey, you got that right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, what a, what else? Final thoughts on this film? Anything else you wanted to dive into? Uh, check it out. Like I do, my own. I'm trying to put my nostalgia aside. Like I think this is a very good movie. This is also a good one to show to a young person to get them into musicals because that's what my dad did to me when I was like eight, nine years old. He sat me down. He's like, I love this movie. 
you're going to love this movie. Yeah. And he showed me like four musicals in a row, I think like four weekends in a row one time when I was a kid. And he showed me like real classic ones, like here's Guys and Dolls, here's The Music Man, here's West Side Story, here's Little Shop of Horrors. And, and here's like, how to I brainwash love- your children. <laughs> Like, I love them all, but I feel like Little Shop was the one that, like, cinched it for me. Because okay. it is weird, and it's funny, and, like, the music's really strong. And, like, if your kid has seen, like, Little Mermaid, this <laughs> will feel, like, this will kind of hit that same emotion. Like, oh, I like this music, too. And, like, I don't, I don't know why. It's very know. catchy yes, songs. Yes, yes. <laughs> I've, I've been humming the songs all day yesterday i was sitting there yeah. p- p- playing pokemon being yeah and like it's <laughs> got adult themes but it's not like so adult you couldn't show it to like a, like a 10 year old yeah yeah it's good it's it's a lot of fun i mean yesterday was my first t- time yeah. watching it and it holds up I think it's mm-hmm. really good. We we barely t- t- talked about Audrey Two and the plant, but it looks amazing. <laughs> it does. Like, it it look. I don't I don't know how they made that happen, but it's There's... magic. And uh, you know, I, I like that's one of the 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 things is if you go back and you watch movies from around that time, there's. There's a, a a good handful of exceptions, but most of them are like, Ugh, these effects don't hold up, or this mm-hmm. is very obviously this one, like that's very obviously a puppet and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And this, I mean, yeah, like you know, it's not yeah. a real thing, but for it to work the way it d- d- does for it to have all of the like vine tendrils things, and for its mouth to move, and yes. For- people to fit inside it and like go down into it and like it's just i i I don't know how they made i'm sure they had multiple versions of the the thing to make it look different ways and stuff like that but it looks fantastic i i think it really holds up it's a lot of fun the music is super catchy go check Mm -hmm. it out there's also one shot like one final special effects shot i want to talk about there's a shot from like inside somebody's mouth looking out at the dentist and it's yes. like oh they built a giant puppet mouth and put the camera inside and put steve I, martin I, on yeah, the other side at first i was like oh they must have just like done the green screen but then no. he like sticks the thing it's inside like i was like yeah i was like oh that's like on the camera like yeah. he's sticking the d- dental thing which might have even been like a giant d- 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 dental thing i c- couldn't really tell the perspective was strange because you are looking out of the yeah. mouth oh yeah and of... like it's gotta be like some weird tool that they custom made for the shot because it's gotta have like forced perspective to it or something yeah so it must That's have been such a bigger cool on like one end and sm- yeah. like, uh, small enough for it to look like it's in his yeah hands there it was it's fantastic like um, this mo- this is such a good movie technically yes it's worth watching for just the technical stuff alone, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it, it, like it's stuff like this, the makeup effects we saw when we watched American Werewolf in London a few weeks yeah. back. Like, those are all fantastic. If you go back and watch uh, Jurassic Park, like that d- d- dinosaur looks amazing. Yeah. You know? um, and y- 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 even like the old Star Wars stuff, mm-hmm. all of the puppets and stuff look amazing um and i i think this is one that you should check out if you want to go look at some old practical effects that are still amazing yes today so uh i think that kind of wraps us up for talking Mm -hmm. about little shop of horrors so it's my turn to Mm -hmm pitch what we are going to do for this next week i gotta close uh the twitch app on my phone here for a sec so i can pull up my notes um so as always i got three options for Mm -hmm. you to pick from um i i don't have a theme i I know you did a theme this 
past I like week. Themes. Yeah, you you like themes. I like themes every once in a while. I'm I will be like, we're just gonna do all time travel stuff or oh. something. But um, this week I do not have a theme, so I just picked three random stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, first one. This is a graphic or a series of graphic novels that I've seen. I've heard about i haven't ever read them and i've wanted to check them out for a while um so pitch number one is copra volumes one and two Hmm. um i believe it's like c-o-p-r-a huh um and from what i understand this is kind of an indie comic version of suicide squad oh um it's like I, I don't know if it's superheroes. It looks like it is, but it yeah, it looks like v- villains teaming up to go do some other like bigger score or something along those okay. lines. I've heard good things. Uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, it's all written and drawn by one p- person, mm-hmm. um, Mikkel Fife, I believe. Uh, if, if I might be mistaken on that, but yeah. Um, it looks good. I think in total there's c- currently like six volumes out, but I wanted to, mm-hmm. to read the first two and check them out and see what they see, see what was happening with those. Um, pitch number two is something I've uh, I, I I first watched it a year and a half ago, mm-hmm. uh, kind of based off of i found a website that was like here are a list of underrated animes that you should watch so i just started going through them uh and this one was on there it's called kino's journey um i think it's only 12 or 13 episodes but it's about this young girl and her motorcycle who she can talk to um (gasps) And they, like, travel around the world, stopping at all these different towns. Like, each, it's, usually each episode is a different town. And it's kind of this weird, like, mysterious, like, what is really happening in this town that we stopped at today? You know, what's going Mm -hmm. on here? Um, It's it's a much more quiet show. It's not very action packed. There, I mean, there there is some action, but not in like Hollywood movie block b- b- buster type of way. Yeah, uh, it's much slower pace, much more quiet, um, and it's a beautiful anime. Mm-hmm. Uh, I highly recommend. It. I, I don't know if it's if there's a manga version of it or not, uh. um, but I've only seen the anime and it's good like i just googled it and it looks like there's a couple like manga covers in here but i'm mostly seeing anime stills cool 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 um so that was pitch number two pitch number three is a brand new netflix original movie from the cohen brothers called the ballad of buster scruggs what yeah uh it's a western And it seems to be a vignette of, like, six short stories in one film. Um, So I I, I saw it on Netflix. I'm interested in that. The Coen brothers make some fantastic stuff. Um, And it's it's new. It's on – it came on Netflix, like, a week or two ago, something like that. Um, So that that might be worth – checking out okay very interesting set of picks yeah what are you thinking i'm really intrigued by kino's journey because i googled it and it does look beautiful like it's got this kind of miyazaki feel to it less in like the character designs but more in like the settings and just like a little girl and a form of transportation and a journey (laughs) yes yeah (gasps) i might i'm intrigued by this ballad of buster scruggs especially because i don't like a western isn't a genre i know very well 
and I've been wanting to like explore more in like genres I don't know. I I thought about doing all western stuff. Ooh. Oh, that'd be fun to do later down the line. Yeah. I'm kind of stalling for time making sure that this crunchy roll link works. Because I was also okay. like, well, which one of these things is easiest to obtain? And okay, it looks like Kino's Journey is pretty easy for me to watch. So I'm going to go with that one. Sounds good. Kino's yeah. Journey. Um, I'm I'm happy you picked this. I So before you and I were doing the review show, mm-hmm. um, and it was me and my friend P- Paul, and we had, when it was just the Whatnots mm-hmm. podcast, cast way back in the day um i had pitched this one to him like two or three times and it never got picked um and and so i'm finally because i like it's it's one of those shows that i saw and i watched i was like i want to talk about this with someone this is fantastic um so cool it's finally getting it's time to shine awesome kino's journey and it, it, it i mean i don't know if you have a subscription to Crunchyroll or not, but it sounds one. like it's it's on Crunchyroll. Um, I'm sure you can find it elsewhere on the internet. Yeah. Uh, to uh, it might even I, I think at one point I saw it on Hulu. I'm not sure if it's on there or not. I could be wrong and talking out of my ass. So take that with a grain of salt. Um. But yeah. That should be a lot, a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that for next week. Yeah, that seems neat. So take it home, Melissa. All right. This has been the Whatnots Review Show. You can join us next week. We'll be talking about Kino's Journey. That sounds like just a fun, sweet anime adventure with a cool motorcycle. Yeah. And remember, you can Murder follow up. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> remember, you can follow us on Twitter at the Whatnots. You can go to thewhatnots.com, check out our shows to oh, past yeah. episodes. We've got a live streams page there. You can donate to our Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Patreon.com slash the Whatnots. Yes, come check us out. Come give us a hand. We'd really appreciate it. Give us and all your you money. Can... <laughs> We need to buy our own plants and name brand domestic goods. Yes. <laughs> and you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at WilkyWit. That's W-I-L-K-Y-W-I-T. And Kyle, where can they find you? You guys can find me uh, at Yo Kyle Springer on both Twitter and Instagram. All right. Thanks for joining us. You guys have a cool week. Adios, guys. Bye. Bye.